Good morning, world. My name is Ted, and we are here to talk about resource allocation in the chemical sector. Thanks for joining the Business of Cyber Show, where we talk about time, people, and energy, the three resources we never have enough of. And in order to use them really wisely, as we've said all year long, I'm joined today by a, a special guest coming all the way from Amsterdam, and I'm super excited to talk about the overall resource allocation in the chemical space. Uh, this is a, a Really, I think the 16th installment of the security, excuse me, the uh, the business of cyber show. And as we go through our slides all the way back to, to one, uh, wanted to talk about specific sectors. We've talked about the voting sector this year. We talked about oil and gas. We haven't yet talked about the chemical manufacturing. And I'm super excited to be joined uh, by someone from Amsterdam, originally from the United States, Mr. Randy Connor. Randy, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So background goes that you and I were actually introduced by a fellow colleague from Amsterdam. Uh, we were talking, I think the first time that we spoke was what, about two quarters ago? Is that is that fair? Uh, and we were actually oh, okay, talking, yeah. I think so. And we were talking about resource allocation in the chemical space, just in a intro call. Uh, and you had always said, hey, look, uh, as, your, as the show continues to evolve, let me know if you'd like like some input, and I, I, you know, I'm I'm really grateful that you uh, you decided to join today. Um, I'd love to to begin the show by having the audience learn a little bit more about your background, kind of what the foundation of your learning is, and to help me do that, I think that we've got a slide here. Tell us, Randy. All right, picture's a little dated, but uh, uh, not too bad. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I've done over 20 years in the security space. Um, I started out at one of the, or the first MSSP out there at IBM. We built that MSSP from scratch. So um, that's pretty much where I started in the early, or late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, so I've been doing this a while, been around, um, been Chief Information Security Officer, VP of IT Security, various jobs, various companies. Um, and in various different positions. Uh, member of the SANS Advisory Board um, means I scored well. Um, Gartner CISO Governing Body member, um, various other groups as well. So um, I like to give back as much as uh, I take. Well, I appreciate that. And I think the ecosystem is gonna appreciate that as well. We're already starting to get some comments online. So looks like we've got great attendance. The entire focus for the business of cyber series stemmed from a presentation that I did in March of this year, where I got up and talked from a CEO of a product perspective, as well as a former auditor. I was talking about resources. I was talking about cybersecurity resources available to CISOs and, and their teams are generally not going to be growing at an infinite rate. That's an assumption. I think there's data to support that globally. And then as we think about resources, I look at resources as the amount of time we have and the amount of people, the energy, and then the budget. And so our first conversation that we ever had, Randy, you tended to agree with me on a couple of those. Can you give the audience a little bit of an understanding of where resources, are they limited in the chemical sector? Generally, what your overall perspective is as kind of a foundation for our discussion today? Yeah, sure. So, you know, to be honest, right, uh, folks of us that work in the CISO space, we know no matter what industry you're in, you, you know, it's with maybe the exception of finance, uh, you're always having difficulty with resources for cybersecurity efforts. Uh, but the chemical ma and manufacturing space specifically, it's even more uh, difficult uh, because everything there is about cost inputs. Um, the money that you put in, the money that you spend to create a widget, to create a chemical, uh, that all comes out of essentially profit. So uh, the more you can reduce that cost, the better you are. And security, of course, is, is the opposite of that. We need to spend money to reduce risk. So yes, it's a constant uh, struggle for any CISO to, to get the, the funding and the time from other people uh, to get the work that needs to be done. I understand. Now you spent 
a majority of your career, like most CISOs in critical infrastructure, previously in the IT space. Is that correct, sir? That is correct, yes. And, and so I started out like many of us uh, in IT. Right. Well, I think the, you know, the OT side of the house is one where you either come, there's not a lot of lateral insertion, right? You either come from the automation space or you come from the security space and the security space has generally been IT focused. So my question is, and we even had a show on that, you know, the, the term OT cyber is relatively young. What would you say are the, some of the top things about chemical company CISO where you own OT and IT? and the differentiation of how you went to, to see your security program on a daily basis, generally the responsibilities you had compared to previous roles where it was maybe more IT, maybe more privacy, maybe more uh, data oriented than, than physical systems. Could you comment on that just to lay the foundation of, of being a CISO in a chemical space and the difference there? Yeah, I mean, just I would say that, um, you know, a CISO can really work in, in just about any industry. I look at them similar to a CFO where data is data, numbers are numbers, right? Mm -hmm. And how you protect that data is pretty much the same. There's some nuances, right? Credit card data, privacy data, things like that. But generally, as you know, you can pick those things up fairly easy. What is different is in the OT space. OT security is completely different than IT security. There's so many different aspects and we don't have enough time to go into all those differences now, but just that the OT space um, requires a different kind of mindset. Uh, it requires um, different timing, different amount of time to address issues and, and resources and allocations and stuff like that. So. When I started, I was fortunate enough to start in a manufacturing company, but on the IT side. And we didn't at the time realize that uh, manufacturing had issues until um, we started getting viruses and some of the our products were technical in nature. And so sometimes we actually ship products with viruses on them. Um, and obviously that wasn't good. So uh, we had to rethink how we approached um, cybersecurity and uh, in the OT space. And that was just a hardware manufacturing role. Whereas, um, you, you know, other, other roles uh, in manufacturing, especially, specifically chemicals, um, it becomes even more of a difference because now you're talking about something that's continuously running 24 by seven, uh, seven days a week, 365 days a year, um, you're producing something. So you have to keep yeah. that in mind. I tend to agree. I came from, you know, my background before I was a product company CEO, I actually owned a chemical company that deployed not only chemicals, but services and training within a host of different industries. And the first difference that I had, I had a different set of, of differences that I was dealing with because I was coming from Shell into that role where I was an auditor. So I used to audit external facilities all the time. And then when I actually own my own facility, switching from an auditor role to the actual P&L owner role, where you're actually owning the risk, where you actually are owning uh, the responsibility of not only identification of missing controls, but actually getting them better and putting resources towards it, that was a big shift for me. So, um, you know, the chemical com the chemical sector has always been one that um, second to, to energy, uh, particularly upstream and downstream, this is where I spent most of my time. Um, and so it's, it's exciting to talk about it today. I'm very interested to hear about some of those, some of those items. This is our agenda folks that we're going to talk about today. Uh, the first topic is just limited resources. We're going to get specific, and Randy, I'd love for you to dive into some of the tools of, of what made you successful over the years. Uh, focused on three things to remember. I'm interested to, to, to hear what those are. Recommendations for first-year CISOs, and then finally, there's uh, we'll close out with uh, some things that Randy has shared as uh, what we call the three Cs. So anything to add, Randy, or should we just dive in? Let's go for it. All right. Sounds good. So your first slide that, that you put together is I, I posed the question and I'm really interested. 
Um, time, people, and budget are kind of the resources that I've always used when I think, or the names or buckets that I've always used when I think about limited resources. We, you know, time is fleeting. We always know that people tend to put way too much on a product roadmap or a improvement roadmap. Um, there generally are not enough skilled folks in the industry, uh, uh, which means that we have a limited amount of energy, a limited amount of skill sets that we have access to at the asset owner level. Um, and then finally, budgets. You know, where where they are is, I think, relative to what the leadership at that company deems appropriate. Generally, I think that budgets have increased, especially for OT in the uh, in in the past couple of years. But taking a look at where we're at globally, macroeconomics, taking a look at the pressures that a lot of chemical companies have in their raw materials and the price of their, their sold goods. We won't get into the details of all the different types of chemical manufacturing that exists, but generally speaking, what have you found to be unique about the chemical sector when we're talking about limited resources, Randy? Well, like I was leading to before, um, one of the biggest issues is time and resources, as you say, right? The people, um, you know, when you're doing the chemical manufacturing, there's, there's especially versus other kind of manufacturing, chemical manufacturing is inherently dangerous uh, from a human safety perspective. And because of that, the change control that's necessary at a chemical plant is way higher uh, than what is, is needed at a widgets factory, for example. Mm -hmm. Right. So safety is a number one concern of, in a chemical company. And so you have to make allowances for the time that it takes to verify things, to to implement something. If you want to implement a, a vault, you know, a, a fix for a vulnerability, it has to be tested. Uh, if that vulnerability causes any sort of disruption in the process, you know, you can have a chemical release. Right. And you're not talking about just danger to your employees. You're talking about danger to the immediate public and depending on the chemicals, even, you know, a greater population. So um, so thinking about that, it's really building in the time that's necessary, but also having the resources, because when it comes to OT, um, you know, they're not going to let you come in as an IT professional and mess with their systems. That just doesn't happen. So you need to call up on those resources at the sites uh to to actually implement changes and in order to do that well you got to be on a good relationship with them or they're not going to let you in i just was going to comment on that this idea to patch at all costs was previously shared on the show as kind of the it methodology but when you bring ot into yeah. the game it becomes process safety at all costs and the differentiation there is the amount of time to implement either your vulnerability patching or any sort of change in your infrastructure. Do you agree with that mentality, Randy? I do to an extent. I think we can change it a little bit and say it's all risk-based, right? So when you get down to the fundamental aspect of uh, security, it's about risk. And what you need to do in a chemical manufacturing process is also calculate in, you know, uh, uh, human safety risk, right? So, um, and to a lesser degree, but also important is downtime, right? So if you're going through and patching something and it caught, you know, it, it brings down the plant or you have to bring down the plant in order to patch it, or it could potentially cause an issue for human safety, you absolutely you know, need to factor that in as another form of risk. And so all of your cal calculation as to which um, vulnerabilities you address or which uh, security issues you address need to also factor in those other forms of risk. Right, right. It's a great point. And I love where you're going because what I keep thinking about is most people don't understand that when you when you have chemicals, not all chemicals are built equally at one facility, right? Now, not getting into the depth of the asset owners that you've been a leader at. What I think most people misunderstand is that not every chemical facility produces a product that has the same business outcomes or business impacts, right? So you may have four or five facilities 
all in different regions. And yes, they may have a chemical site, maybe they're a storage site. Those chemicals are required at another one of your facilities as raw goods. And so when you actually think about the profit and loss or even the human safety element at one facility versus another, uh, I've found in my experience that it's not, you know, the sum of 10 does not equal what you may think it, it is. You may need to focus because of the safety implications or the profitability implications at two of your sites, more security resources than the other eight put together. Do you concur based on your experience that different sites need different levels of security? Absolutely. And 100% Ted. Absolutely agree with that. Yeah. You, um, you really should have a matrix of uh, priority for your plants on what you want to roll out to based on a number of factors, including including profitability at the site, how long the site can be down without losing money, uh, but safety as well. Some products out there are more dangerous than others. And, and you know, it's, it's interesting, but some sites even may not be as valuable a site or may be more energy intensive. Some products uh, require a lot more energy to do. And when energy prices spike, then production goes down possibly, right? And if that happens, actually, that's a um, good time to take advantage, right? Because uh, if you're not producing as much, you have um, possibly some time that the folks on site can work on uh, security. So, so you're connecting resource allocation, primarily time, and matching it to your overall operational timeline is what you're really stating. You're taking a look at all the macroeconomic factors. You're you're tied in with your maintenance team. You're tied in with the ops folks. You're tied in with all the PL owners and a good relationship with the security and risk management leaders to those departments. You're actually saying enables you to achieve more in your security life cycle because you're able to implement changes or patches when a facility is doing some planned downtime. Yes. That's correct. Yes. Now there's a caveat to that, which is during downtime can actually be a very busy time for the plant because right, all the people right. can be working. So what's important is to work with those site personnel, those site managers directly to schedule that, right? You never want to do yeah. something. You schedule something on your own. You work directly with them and say, look, we've got this. It's going to take probably X amount of time to implement when can we do this? Oh, you can do yeah, it next year. Sense. Okay. But, but Randy, not everybody thinks like that. And I'm not going to knock on anybody without specifically OT or automation experience, but there are some belief systems that security is, maybe security doesn't have to be, I'm not diminishing security, but it, not everybody views it as one component. You've got a safety officer, you've got an automation officer working with tons of different you know, technical tools in your stack and equipment that all has a life cycle. You've got physical security and every one of them, in my view, is a little bit of a spoke on a wheel. And what, what I'm hearing you say is a good cyber or security leader is going to integrate with those teams flawlessly, which is definitely going to take time versus an alternate view that I've seen. And I see happen all the time is that the security leader doesn't tie in like a spoke on a wheel, recognizing, you know, you can't just stop operations. What's the implication of not having that teamwork, not having that trusted relationship across operations, automation, and some of your PL owners? It's, it's pretty straightforward. You're just, just not going to get anything done. You just won't. People won't <laughs> trust you. Put. They won't work with you. They won't let you in their site. They won't do the things that you, they will do stall tactics. If they want to be, you know, um, under the under the radar kind of pushback, if you will, they will do all kinds of things. And I've seen the all the 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 flip side of that is when you do work together. Um, I've worked on projects where we actually had sites coming to us asking to deploy to them next. That's when you have a good relationship. That's when you have the right level of relationship. Sites coming to you and asking you to come to them next. That's that's what I think we all strive for. And I think I put up a question so the audience can start to look at it. I think you've answered about 80% of it, Randy. 
But while the audience is reading that, I'll, I'll make one point. I think that what you said is spot on. I think that the, the entire conversation about limited resources blends extremely well with operational timeline is that we can't just stop operations to fix something. So if you don't establish the foundation of trust, if you don't under and trust is then rooted upon your understanding of how ops actually work in an OT environment, then you're never going to okay. be able to get anything fixed. So I appreciate your perspective to finalize this point. I wanted to uh, bring up a comment. Uh, could Randy address and rank his top five outcomes or risk aspects of OT security in the chemical manufacturing, for example, personal safety equipment? I think you've done that. I think the first thing you mentioned was, was safety. You did mention downtime. Uh, any words to add uh, to answer this question effectively, Randy? Yeah, well, I think I think maybe, and I might get this wrong, but I think maybe they're asking more on a technical level. Um, some top risks are obviously vulnerabilities, right? Vulnerabilities in the environment. And you see that through the full stack, um, however you want to look at it, um, whichever Purdue model or, you know, any other model that you want to use. Um, there's what I call the gray area in between IT and OT. Um, there's the IT part that's on site. All these different things need to be fixed, right? You need to prioritize that uh, from a vulnerability perspective. Um, you need to look at things like MFA, um, you know, one thing that's different about manufacturing is they have a much, much larger uh, remote access um, component to them than a typical corporate IT would. You have uh, all the various DCS uh, companies um, remote accessing into your environment, right? What does that mean? You need to make sure you have MFA there. You need to have uh, protections there, right? You, yep. you need to have network segmentation. Um, you know, that's uh, a couple of the top three ones, um, you know, site security or security or, or folks on site with some level of cybersecurity experience. Um, and, you know, don't forget physical security, right? Makes sense. USB drives being plugged into systems, email. Yeah. All good points. All good points. Let's move to the next phase. Um, this is a good one. So this was a question, top three things to know become, before becoming CISO of a chem company. Now, you actually had a very unique set of experiences where you were managing IT specifically for a manufacturing company, right? I think that gave you maybe an understanding of operational technology or critical environments. Um, how give, give us a top three, and then maybe we dive into a couple. Yeah, so we've actually kind of covered a few a couple of these already a little bit right one right. is the relentless focus on cost inputs right um chemical companies a little bit different than a widget manufacturer or a software manufacturer for example right so uh with a chemical manufacturer the price is the price we sell by the ounce the gallon um the pound you know or the tub or the barrel or whatever right and that is the price um, but if you make 20 gallons of something and it costs X amount and the next 20 gallons costs Y amount, you're still selling that 55 gallon drum for the same price, right? So there's a relentless focus on costs on inputs and labor is one of those, right? So labor being one of the most important aspects other than the actual plant itself, the, you know, um, you are constantly striving to reduce that labor cost, right? And, and we're doing that in the chemical manufacturing and other manufacturing through automation, right? A lot of our products are getting automated, things are moving to the cloud, that sort of thing. Um, but there's that, just that relentless focus on cost. And, you know, security is a cost center. We cost money. Sure. Um, we require people's resources and time. And to do that, you know, Plants are already running lean because they're trying to reduce costs as much as possible. So to be able to get someone's time at a plant, that's difficult. Again, yeah. that comes down to building those relationships. That's a good point. So just to backtrack a little bit, if the 
a lot of these chemical companies are also selling bulk chemical at bulk prices negotiated outside of the microeconomics view is is another perspective that I could share. Um, coming from that space, the relentless pursuit of efficiency uh, in a chemical plant is important. Question, how much do you feel that the sizzle role plays a role in digitization? We see it happening all the time. It's like, well, we have 64 humans doing this project. If we built in some robotics, we did some automated maintenance. If we were able to connect to the cloud and and look at all these different data points, we might become more efficient over time. And all that looks and sounds great, whether it's automation, whether it's digitization, but it all comes at a cost for security. Where do you feel the CISO role yesterday, today, and tomorrow fits within that decision-making matrix for chemical companies? Well, that's a good question, right? Um, you know, in every company, that's going to be a little bit different on the digitization part, where they fit into it and what role they play in it. This is, has a lot to do with um, essentially politics, um, culture, and the way the organization is structured, to be honest. But, you know, um, I'll give you an example. Uh, we rolled out, you know, um, a version of ChatGPT. I was the one who led that effort in our company. So we brought in some efficiency tools in that sense, ChatGPT, depending if you find that efficient or not. Uh, you know, that was led by my group. Um, you can use that to, to help. But the bottom line is, um, sites are looking to reduce labor, and that means creating that automation, that digitization, uh, all those uh, tools to be brought in to help reduce those costs, right? So what a CISO needs to do is they need to get, make sure that they're in there early, right? That they're part of that decision process, and that's a sure. tough struggle. Um, you know, you, you've got business that wants to, you know, drive right ahead, and in the past, CISOs have been seen as the, the department of no. Um, so you've got to make sure that you start out of the gate running saying, look, we're here to advise, we're here to help. That's all we're going to do. And you need to follow that up with actual actions, right? You don't come in and say, for example, I'm going to change the standards. The standards are wrong. They don't address security properly. Oh, really? Right. Do you have the right tools in place to address those? You have the right people to address this. You can't just change standards in a vacuum or policies in a vacuum, right? So think about things like that. You That's a good point. really need to. Um... So relentless oh, sorry, focus on. Well, the, no, you bring up a good point. I think it should be committee driven as well. And I don't think that changes to anything in organization should happen unless it's going to make the next person more successful. I think cybersecurity is a journey. I think quality, I think safety, I think process automation, digitization, these are long journeys, right? And so as long as there is a system that is getting better and better with every change, I think that's the root of a, of a self-healing, self-improving organization. The challenge is whether it's quick turn or whether it's folks that don't have that vision, I feel that there's a lot of organizations that are just, you know, kind of shotgun blasting their cybersecurity approach. They're spending a lot on on products they really can't use. Great example previously brought up. Not every chemical plant has the same business outcome. As a result, it may not need the same level of, you know, tooling or services. Most people don't get that in the space. Um, but you got to also have the end in mind, right? So this is a journey. And I think... I think specific to the to the chemical sector, a, a CISO saying, watch out for your costs. I mean, uh, that's excellent. And I think more people need to hear it. What are the other two things that uh, that a CISO in the chem space would need to know to be effective, Randy, in your in your view? Well, like we discussed earlier as well, and you've said multiple times, right, the, the focus on safety, on human right. safety. Uh, can't express that enough, but that's also something that you can take advantage of, right? To get your message out there, to get yeah. uh, change in the sites, um, you know, implemented. 
because when you turn security as a risk and show that it's tied to that same safety risk, right? If, for example, a malicious attacker comes in and releases some chemical, right? Or, uh, you know, you can't control your plant because you've got ransomware. Both those situations cause a human safety risk. And, you know, if you show that and you can tie that and communicate and tell a story about that, you can start to change the culture in these companies and, and change that safety, relentless focus on safety into a relentless focus on human safety and cybersecurity safety. I, th I think we've seen, I, I think they're very co positively correlated. I think the better your cybersecurity, the better you know, your safety of your automation systems is. So I tend to agree. Um, it, it's interesting how many connections there are to physical security, to safety, and to digitization that ties back to cyber. What's your third one, Randy? <laughs> um, well, it doesn't have too much to do with security, but um, the chemical industry is, is really incestuous. You know, we have uh, cl uh, competitors of ours that buy our product. We sell product to them. Um, it, it, it goes all kinds of different ways. But the good news out of that is uh, we're allowed because of that to have deeper relationships even with our competitors. So as a CISO, I've been able to reach out to competitor CISOs and understand how they're tackling an issue or share my idea about how I'm tackling an issue. And so that's something that I've really seen as much stronger in the chemical industry than any other industry I've worked in for CISOs. You just have a tremendous ability to share knowledge. Uh, it's where we need to go. And in fact, if you think about it, I would say the chemical industry in that one aspect is ahead of every other industry out there because other CISOs, they're afraid to share knowledge. They're afraid to share experiences. Um, you know, we don't talk about breaches, right? We don't talk about the things we're doing because, well, if a hacker finds out about that or whatever, right? So I think it's one great aspect. And if you get into chemical cybersecurity, take advantage of it. So you're saying chemical security and risk management leaders in your experience tend to share information with each other more than other sectors? That's correct. And you're, and you're stating that that is a plus on the side of the chemical manufacturers because the more access to data that we have, the more collective our armed defense can become. Some of my best ideas weren't mine. <laughs> yeah, I love it. I know, I don't want to come up with all the great ideas. I just want to implement them well. Um, that's really That's really something. So just to recap, folks, when asked the top three things that a CISO should know before going into the chem space. Randy's perspective is number one, cost-centric mentality. Costs really matter. It's not a runaway train. You can't just buy everything. Number two, safety focus is how you get things done. And number three, um, knowledge sharing is paramount. Those are, those are very genuine and unique. I appreciate you sharing. Um, yes. We're starting to have a couple more questions. Let me see. To me, the challenge with IT, great. I'm going to move to our next slide. And let's talk about the first hundred days, you know. Um, I think this, this question of a CISO jumping into that role for the first year, I think it's different if you're coming from the space. I think it's probably going to be different if you're already part of the company. But with those kind of being assumptions that we're not going to dial into, what's your general advice for somebody that is going to be a CISO? Uh, for their first year in that role? Well, I think the first thing you really need to focus on is look at the situation you're, you're coming into, right? Um, I would go back all the way to the interview if that's where you're coming from and making sure you understand where the leadership culture is and uh, also understand where the cybersecurity program is. Are you coming in as the first CISO ever or are you taking over something that was already a program. You then need to look at that program and uh, my advice would be to do an assessment at some level, right? Uh, you wanna do 
it could be a very deep dive technical assess, assessment or high level assessment, but you really want to know where the program is. Um, you can't give good information to leadership. You can't give good information to the board of directors if you don't know where you are. And you have to know where you are before you can start moving ahead. And better to start out with the big picture, looking at everything, knowing everything that you have. You will get all kinds of bad information from employees about what you have, what you don't have. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've made decisions based on bad information I received from a security employee or IT uh, employee, right? Uh, I don't like to get caught like that. So some sort of third party assessment really is beneficial. Um, then once you identify your gaps, you're gonna want to um, develop a roadmap. But before you develop that roadmap, you're also gonna wanna establish, well, how am I gonna measure? How am I gonna decide what is the priority? Now we talked about risk earlier, uh, CISOs and security leaders, that's what they need to focus on. That's the language they need to talk in. That's the language that other leadership understands as risk. So formulate everything into a risk story, right? Talk about um, that. But you really want to identify what those items are that you need to address based on risk, whether it's uh, complexity, the cost of to fix it, or the overall risk reduction. You want to think about those three things, right? You want to think about how um, those all factor into kind of like a priority ranking. Uh, complex projects, the way I like to describe them, right? One projects that take a while to do or take a lot of resources to do. And I don't just mean funding. I also mean like human resources. So that means right. plan. Right? That's the game. I mean, how many people are trying to save a buck by, by buying at the end of the calendar year, but they don't ever think about the implementation window? or they buy something that creates so much data, they don't think about the, the work to actually make sense of the data. Um, no, very well put. So starting with an assessment, you mentioned third party. I think there's a lot of different ways. You know, you could do technical assessments. You could do figure out what you have through asset inventory. You could do gap assessments. Usually, I, I find chemical companies are gonna have a set of data that already exists. How do you make the decision of using some of that data that may be old or stale. And we're talking about controls gap data. We're talking about asset inventory. We're talking about tooling. How do you make a decision early on the, the value of that data versus, and, and trying to transition it into your overall thought model of where you're gonna, what gaps you're gonna close versus starting fresh and clean? How, how does the CISO, you know, what are the factors that you would take into consideration if there's a bunch of existing data when you show up and whether to use it or yeah, not. Yeah, I've over time developed an ideology, I believe in start fresh. Right. Start from ground zero and build up your knowledge. Um, take that old information with a heavy dose of salt. Uh, yeah. You know, you can use it. It could potentially be valuable, but um, I would rather use it to back up what the assessment finds rather than that makes sense kind of use it as a supplemental rather than your primary data source that's right yeah i mean we're getting to the state where you know whether it's a nist whether it's nis whether it's a iec 62443 isa doc we're getting to the point where there exists these data models right i find that some of them are so cumbersome that it's hard to kind of sift through that i've seen third parties come in and just make sense of the data um, I actually think you, you should try to use as much data as you, as possible, so long as you can trust that the, the methodology was not too subjective, which I think is tough to do sometimes. Um, do you find a controls based methodology or standard versus a risk based as plus or minus for either of those when a CISO steps in the shoes? At well, least I think, it, yeah, I mean, I think. You, that's one of the first things you really should do is establish what kind of model you're going to use, what framework right. you're going to use, right? Um, I happen to like NIST because NIST is risk-based rather than controls and policy-based. So, um, 
you know, I think it sells well as well to leadership because again, it's risk-based, right? You're talking the language they talk. Um, and the great thing about something like NIST is you pick and choose what is your priority item that you need to work on versus you need to have X, Y, and Z, A, B, C, all these things, right? They're all check marks. You need to have all these things in place. That's not security. That's having things in place, right? So yeah, I think it's better to take, you know, NIST and look at that and look at all the controls in there and say, well, you know, we're doing all right on this one or right. we don't really have this issue. Uh, for example, right? Um, one of the companies I used to work at was a software development company, right? Uh, another company I worked at had 450 different applications they were running internally, and they weren't a software company. Another company I worked at has no internal applications, and it's amazingly awesome <laughs> because you don't have to worry about software security at that point, right? So you have to think about those. If you're implementing NIST, you don't have to put a policy in place or an SDLC system in place or you know anything like that. You can get to you get to choose that, and that's what the value of it is, right? You get to choose based on the company, the culture, everything there, what the priority projects that you need to work on are, and that's the value of that. Well, I appreciate your perspective. I I think that that's the way security programs should be rolled out. Like I said, it's an evolution from who came before you and it's an evolution for what you leave behind. It's a great finishing point. Um, whether you choose controls, risk-based to me, it's less important about the what it's far more important about the how and the where, where meaning, where are we going? What are we going to try to get done over a one, three, five year program? How does the board of directors, how does all the P and L owners, how do the maintenance, safety, security, how do all these people play a game? And I think that's been a theme of our discussion. We're coming up on time and we're coming up on our last slide. It's the three C's. Now, I know that you had, I, I read these earlier when we were going over kind of the pre-call, but let's talk about the three C's, culture, communication, and costs to finish us out on this great exercise that we've been on, Randy. All right. So these are my three C's. Culture being the longest tail, you need to get started on that one first. Uh, you got absolutely have to change culture in the company, especially if you're working in um, manufacturing. There's a lot of legacy. I mean, let's be honest. A lot of the process engineers are pretty old. Um, the equipment's old. Everything's old. Um, there's a lot of legacy there, and you need to take that into account. Um, so there's a lot of cultural change. Every company has it. Security is very slowly starting to become more and more important to companies. Um, and it's your job to push that through, uh, to change that culture, to change the culture at the sites, to get them security minded, right? But how do you do that is the next C, communications. I can't express enough. And I know everybody's heard this. You hear it time and time again, communication is key. But it really is. That's that's so important. As a CISO, your job is probably a good 50% communicating. You're communicating to the leadership. You're communicating to the board. You're communicating to your employees. You're communicating to other groups. You're constantly communicating, and you're trying to sell stories. You're trying to sell your vision. You're trying to get budget. You're constantly in communication, building relationships. It's so critical. And then, of course, as we discussed, cost, right? Um, we get caught up a lot of times on buying the shiny thing or the next bling bling or uh, problem solver or whatever. But, you know, at the top of the heap, when the CEO is looking at things, he's looking at how do they increase profitability? And that's what you've always got to keep in mind. What are you doing to improve the business? Okay. So, from a Cybersecurity perspective, we're a cost center. We know that we cost money. There's nothing we can really do about that. But we have to show it. We have to tell it in a way where we're reducing risk and we're protecting the company from major losses. That's our story. And that's what you need to change and communicate. 
and keep in mind. Cost is everything. Communicate how you're saving and you're reducing risk. Randy, that's, that's very well put. I appreciate it. That really closes us up for time. We don't have tons of questions. I want to thank you for joining the Business of Cyber Show. Um, you know, this entire conversation is about resources. It's about looking through the lens of a security and risk management leader at the critical infrastructure space. And I've always said that if you understand your business, you understand the business outcomes, then you're going to be able to, to take that to the better, to better your security program. And, and great case study that you offered today in the chemical space about costs and making sure that you as a security leader understand there is a limit here because we have to be profitable. I love your three C's. I couldn't agree more on generally the aging population of our automation teams out there. Culture is huge. I, I love the idea that communication is huge and keeping it cost centric. It's a great alignment with uh, as always has been between the two of us is a great alignment to where I think the security and risk management leaders of tomorrow need to be thinking. Um, it's always great having people that bring new ideas to the show. And I want to thank you for that. Um, congratulations. I understand you're on a new board effective this week. Uh, check That's out right. Randy's profile on LinkedIn. We wish you the best of luck. I'll give you the final word, sir. All right. Well, um, Thanks to everyone for listening in. I really appreciate that. Uh, I hope I was able to impart some wisdom uh, and share my experience. And, um, you know, reach out to me on LinkedIn if uh, you have any other questions or, um, you know, you're thinking about going into the field yourself. Perfect. Randy, thanks so much for your time. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Ted. Join us next week for a new installation of the Business of Cyber Show. Uh, more details to come out of what that's going to be. Y'all have a wonderful day. Thanks.